how do you write large scale slash enterprise style software in general, but also in Next.js? What are the patterns that separate regular software from enterprise scale software? And what does that even mean? You and I are going to take a look at what enterprise means in practice. I'm going to tell you from my own experience on enterprise and startup using a boilerplate as an example that just recently came out and went pretty viral on social media. A production grade turbo repo template for Next.js apps. What does this even mean, production grade? We're gonna see that in a second together. A mono repo template designed to have everything you need to build your new SaaS app as quickly as possible. And that includes authentication, nice. Okay, we're gonna see how that's done. Billing, using Stripe for payments, right? So users can subscribe to your pro plan. Analytics, and this part, honestly, the analytics, the observability is really well done in this app, as you'll see. SEO, a database or um, and w much more stuff, right? It's hard to articulate feature flags and all that stuff, it's all in here and it got like 2000 stars. Now the background behind why this got so popular so fast, this turbo repo template is this tweet right here, right? It comes down to this pretty much. It's a tweet from the guy who runs Vercel, right? The CEO, his name is Guillermo. And he made a tweet about this, a production grade mono repo first full stack Next.js template. And then there's the command to just initialize your project with it very thoughtfully engineered. This is true. We're going to see that and documented. It covers auth, DB and ORM payments, docs, right? Docs wasn't listed before on the website, but documentation is also included. A blog, which is one of the most interesting parts, emails and even feature flags and dark mode. There is so much stuff going on in the starter point that it's really hard to get a first look. Like a lightning fast app template, start building your app with a Shatsy and UI template that's already set up with everything you need. Now I'm a bit confused here. Why does a UI library make our app fast? Like I don't see the connection here. Maybe it's just faster to set up the UI. Maybe that's what they mean. And what I find probably most interesting about this repo is this right here, the cross-platform API, because this is something you'll actually see in enterprise context, which doesn't mean it makes sense in your app. We're going to get there. But basically, we are splitting our API into a microservice for many different apps with a type safe database ORM, which is Prisma. Now, this is the most interesting part. We're going to get there, but let's quickly finish this feature section. What else is in here? We got emails using React email. We got a type safe blog using a library that I have never heard of before, but that's actually turns out to be pretty cool, which is called content collections. Because what content collections allows us to do is the following. Let's go to the hosted website right here that I started up in the background. And this has a blog and what the this library allows us to do is to basically write blog articles like this one, Understanding GDPR, a complete guide for businesses, which just serves an example as an example, right? It lets us write these in MDX, which is Markdown XML, kind of a React Markdown syntax. So for example, this GDPR article is completely type safely written in MDX and then converted into a blog article at build time, right? Not at runtime, at build time, which is really cool. So it's immediately there as a static, really fast blog article. Usually you would use a library called content layer for that, but little history on this MDX library is it got deprecated eventually it stopped being supported, which is why people moved off of it. It was one of my favorite libraries of all time, but yeah, unfortunately it didn't make the cut and eventually it got discontinued. It was lightweight. It had a really, really nice DX. So does this new library and it's blazing fast. So, you know, it's good, right? It got a fancy web page. So that means it must be good. We have documentation built in. Maybe you need it. Maybe you don't need it. It's already in here. Um, that's a common pitfall, right? If you don't need something, well, you'll still get it in this template, right? And a visual database editor, which is the Prisma Studio. Wow, those are a lot of features and a lot of tools. You can see the tools just flying through here that are used in the stack, like recent content collections for the markdown that I just told you about, clerk for auth, post talk for um, analytics, radix UI for UI design, Sentry for observability, CMDK, Fuma docs, I've never even heard of that to be honest, ArcJet for security, Google Analytics, and that's a positive and a negative. At the same time, there's just so much stuff 
in this starter point, which is great to learn from, but it's also kind of the problem that I see with this. So let me get to this. The most interesting pattern that I want to talk to you about is way up here, the microservice pattern for the API. And the reason why this is so interesting is because you'll actually see this in your first enterprise project very, very likely, right? So basically how this works is normally how we write an API in Next.js because this is a, and I've already got the drawing tool open here. Oh, and by the way, yeah, I just made the little list. Like why should we even care about this? What's in here? But we already went through that. Um, so anyways, how we write a Next.js API. And this is assuming we are just building a web application and not a mobile app, right? Basically how this works is or project code. So your whole JSX, your React components, your lib folder, everything lives inside of this Next.js project, right? It's defined in here. And your API that serves the requests from the front end lives in the same Next.js project, right? It's just another folder in your project. And then the project code, the front end, can interact with the API to request data and the API sends that data back to the front end and it all happens encapsulated in the single Next.js app. In this microservice architecture that this app does really well or the starter boilerplate does really well, we create an API microservice. What does that mean? It's a principle of reusability, this microservice architecture. And just because I know you're too lazy, I Google it for you. So what this means is a microservice architecture consists of a collection of small autonomous services. So what that means is your project code does not know about the internal workings of your API, nor does the API really know which project it is serving. And that has benefits and downsides. So how this works is in this boilerplate example or also in enterprise code, because we did it a very similar way when I worked in enterprise, just with Fastify as a backend and not Next.js. That is quite unusual to see a Next.js backend in enterprise from my experience. The difference in architecture is this, the API is no longer part of anything related to our project code. The project code is completely on its own. And actually let's call this microservice arc architecture, right? You, you get the point. The project lives completely independently and so does the API. They do not know about each other, but the front end code can still request data from the API and the API then sends that data back to our front end. And that has the added benefit. Let's rename this to Next.js, by the way. That has the added benefit of very easily being able to introduce new requesters. For example, a mobile app because if your API is super tightly related to your Next.js project, let's also rename it just to Next.js here. If these are super tightly coupled, then how are you gonna introduce an app to this? The app would have to exactly match the API structure that you enforce through Next.js. And that's unlikely, right? In a real world project, that's rarely the case. So if you split up your API to be a microservice, an autonomous service, that is easily compatible, of course, depending on how you design it. But if you design it well, then it's easily compatible with your mobile app and can serve every app that you have. So for example, in the enterprise that I worked in, we had a separate iOS app along with a React front end. We had a Fastify API, which is a Node.js language. I was actually really surprised because my coworkers were like, super experienced, like 30 years of experience in coding, and they like JavaScript on the back end. I was surprised to see that, but it was Fastify. And then we also had an Android app all written in native languages and not something like Flutter, but this was in Swift and this was in like C++, I believe, or whatever you make Android apps with. And the benefit of this microservice architecture is that each app can now be served to and from or API, right? We can request data and that data is then sent back to every single app also including Android, of course, right? This microservice architecture is exactly what's happening in this app in this boilerplate, right? So let's take a look at how they implement this. Just by the folder structure, it's already really easy to tell. We have a top level folder called apps. And in this apps, we have our microservices, those being the API, the app, which I assume in this case means the mobile app, and then web, which is our Next.js website. In practice, the API is its own folder. It contains an app directory with all the logic that 
is handled by the API. Like cron jobs, health checks, right? How does a health check look like? Basically, it's just this, right? We can make a request to this API and check if it's still running. Because serverless functions run in V8 isolates, not on Cloudflare workers, but in general, they're isolated. I, I honestly don't think this makes so much sense because usually this comes from a background of we're checking if the server is down or not. But if each function is completely independent and serverless, anyways, we can run cron jobs where we just create a page and delete it again to check if our database is working. This does make a lot of sense. This is real world actual, like this is a thing, right? Where we just check if the database is working on a schedule, like 15 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it is. So you're instantly notified when something doesn't work. That is very, very real world like. And we also have webhooks for secure implementations for payment with Stripe and for authentication with Clerk, where all events are handled for us. These are more events handled than you'd likely have in a real world app. I run my own SaaS and I handle like three events or something, but this boilerplate handles all of them. And one other thing I want to talk to you about is the abstraction to packages. And this is um, a big point for debate. You'll see this in real world apps, like for example, a open source um, app that takes this approach of reusability via packages is called Dub, right? It's an open source link management infrastructure tool. And it's by far not the only app using this kind of infrastructure that I'm about to show you, but it's good and bad at the same time to use this reusability approach. But I want you to know about it because it can be really, really powerful if you use it right. How it works is basically we have our apps, right? In the case of Dub, this is just the web app. In the boilerplate case, that's the web app and the mobile app. And we have packages. And these packages are basically split logic from the main apps, like styling configs, for example, here with Tailwind, shared utilities and shared UI things and so on. You get the idea, right? So if you want to share pieces between your mobile app and your web app, for example, then you can use something very, very similar to a microservice architecture and just replace the API with, for example, a UI library, right? If you have one design system, you want to use it in all of your apps in Next.js, iOS and Android. So they all look the same. So you don't have to do styling work over and over, right? And how we achieve that in practice is by something called packages. You can see right here, we have our apps and packages, just like in the open source repo I just showed you, where we split up analytics, auth, even or database, right? It, it makes sense in this case, but I'm going to get to why this might not be the best idea environment variables, feature flags, observability, styling with tailwind configs and so on. Now, this, this can be a really good idea because what this allows us to do is to basically use the same database, the same Prisma or M client throughout all of our services like our app and web app and so on. So we always connect to the same database. We always have the same data in our API. But what it also means from a logical standpoint, let's take a look at this. We gotta ask ourselves first off, what is different about enterprise software? What makes enterprise software enterprise. And this is a really big talking point, right? And if you ask 10 people, probably you're going to get 10 different opinions. So here's mine, right? What enterprise means for me is I've worked at one enterprise company. It means your code scales, but probably not in the way that you think I mean this. What I don't mean is your code scales to more users, right? That's not what I mean, not user related. What I don't mean is you can support a sudden influx of a million users and your servers auto scale and everything auto scales, right? That's not what I mean. What I mean, your code is written in a way where it's easily, and this is the main point, easily extendable where you can easily build new internal microservices on your existing code architecture. This also means abstraction. You are really good at abstractions or you get really good at abstractions if you do enough enterprise software because you're kind of forced to, because the code bases are absolutely huge. You're forced into writing nice abstractions that allow you to build new microservices on top of your own abstractions. Because the thing is in enterprise, it's very likely that the code has evolved over years, if not decades, right? 
That is not uncommon to have code that is decades old in enterprise software. And as you might have noticed, the template repository plays exactly into this using reusable packages. In your app, in your web app and so on, it's easily extendable and easily reusable. This is not the most practical if you're starting a new app though, because Imagine this, right? In which scenario do you need to support a web and mobile app? That is the main question. And uh, that's a really long question, man. Here, in which scenario do you need to support a web and a mobile app at the same time while starting your project? You're just getting started and you need both. You need web and mobile. Realistically, when is that gonna happen? Usually it doesn't. Usually the way you start is without a mobile or without a web app, but either one, right? Very, very rarely do you start out with both because fundamentally that's a big financial risk to start out with both. Usually the path is to go with a web app first. I'm biased, I'm a web engineer. Maybe you're more on the mobile side, but the point is you only start with one until you find product market fit. If users do not care about your web app, why would you bother making a mobile app and vice versa, right? And in that case, in this logical argument that I'm making here, splitting stuff up into reusable packages is a good idea if you're an established enterprise, but it's a really, really bad idea if you're just starting out. Because if you have a single app, just a web app, just a Next.js app, you do not need microservices in the way that they're included here in this template repository. This architecture only makes sense for this architecture. If you only have a Next.js app, the splitting up of your UI, of your database and so on into multiple folders, into reusable packages is pure maintainability overhead. There's no benefit because you're making reusable packages like the database that you do not even reuse until you have product market fit. And at that point, you'll probably have the revenue to then refactor into this kind of architecture for usability, right? So what I'm saying here is you start out with a web app and if you go for a enterprise kind of architecture, this is completely unnecessary, right? It's really nice to learn from, to get an idea how enterprise does it, how enterprise services are scaled and built and architected, but it's far from being the best starting point for your own apps. Chances are this right here is the best starting point for your own apps and mine as well, right? Simple apps until you find product market fit, until you notice that, hey, users actually want to buy your products and then the transition is more into enterprise architecture. That's what it means to be enterprise software from me. And of course, your interpretation might differ, but that's the best approach in learning from this repository, right? Take a look at it, take it with a grain of salt, because it doesn't mean you need to start this way, but getting an idea of how enterprise is architected, this is really, really nice for. So I went ahead and linked it in the description for you. And that about wraps up my experience with enterprise software. I work at a startup now. I eventually transitioned over from enterprise to startup because I find the environment more fun. But working at enterprise can be really, really nice for your learning process, right? How do things work at large scale, whatever that means for the company you're working at. That's gonna be it for this video and I'm gonna see you in the next one. Until then, have a good one and bye bye.